Entrepreneurs Over 40, Episode 6, featuring Rick Terrian talking about ageless startups. The world is getting set up for one-person businesses in ways that I've never seen before. So you want to start small. It's the way to do it. The idea is, is that not to be a lone ranger. You're listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40, the show for somewhat mature entrepreneurs and side hustlers. And now your host, Greg Mills. Our guests today learned the lessons of entrepreneurship very early while selling newspapers car-to-cart stoplights. He hasn't stopped creating new business opportunities since. He was awarded the U.S. Small Business New Product of the Year Award by the National Society of Professional Engineers. He's also been recognized by Fast Company as one of their Fast 50. As an innovator, inventor, and business developer with nine U.S. and foreign patents in industrial fluid recycling, his designs have recovered tens of millions of gallons of oil worldwide that were previously lost as wastewater. He was recognized as a Purpose Prize Fellow in 2015. He is currently helping launch and lead one of the most innovative regional food organizations in the world. In summary, he's a lifelong entrepreneur and the author of Ageless Startup, Start a Business at Any Age. Without further ado, Rick Tarian. Hi, Greg. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Now, could you take a few moments and kind of get, bring us up to speed with where you're at now? Sure. Well, I w- was brought to Pittsburgh, where I'm currently living. I raised my family out in Wisconsin. I was r- recruited to come to Pittsburgh to help launch uh, a new kind of a nonprofit focusing on food sustainability, regional food sustainability. Uh, my background is a manufacturer, sort of a uh, I lean into that end of the subject area, and I think we're building something really interesting here. Uh, But it's becoming a mature and successful organization, which means that uh, I'm out of my league in a little bit. Uh, I'm usually at the startup parts of these organizations, so um, I'm very pleased with where it's at. But I'm uh, anxious to take the uh, text of the book, The Ageless Startup, and I am uh, ginning up a new nonprofit around that that we hope to create a global presence around. So it sounds like you enjoy the startup portion of of the business and probably creating systems. I do like the very earliest stages of this. It's messy and it's dirty and there's usually all kinds of broken stuff all over the place. Uh, I like to be the first couple people on site, the first one on site for that. I, I quote a, uh, a a passage from Wellington, the Duke of Wellington, the guy that beat Napoleon. And he said that the entire art of war is knowing what's over the next hill. I'm usually that guy that's over the hill first. Sometimes I come back. Sometimes I come back with arrows shot up all through me. But I usually like that first cutting edge of these things. I was looking at the majority of startups in the U.S. are launched by people over 45. Why do you think that is? And the media itself would seem to indicate that everyone that creates a startup is a young, hip millennial coder that lives out in San Francisco or somewhere in L.A. in helicopters or segways to work. <laughs> You beat me on the helicopter. Well done. Yes. Right. I mean, the the magazine covers are full of young, usually guys, you know, 20 somethings and they've got hockey stick returns and they're surrounded by adoring investors. You know, that stuff's okay. There's nothing, you know, in most cases that if it's not illegal, it's it's fine. It's just that that it's a small part of the story. It's like teaching kids on the playground that they can grow up to be in the NBA, when in fact, the right thing to do is teach kids on the playground how to be lifelong, active people and enjoy the the, the trip. What I did learn is that the majority of startups are done by people who are 45 and older. It's a very exciting time to start to put a toe in the water because you get to guide that ripples that you put in that water. Uh, towards creating your own legacy and uh, solve problems that are in communities you love and markets that you love and uh, with people that are your peers. So I think this is a big opportunity to shine a light on this end of the entrepreneurship story. Now, I know a little bit of your background, but you know, was anyone in your family at all entrepreneurial or was it just kind of you, know, you took the leap and you know, went from there? No, it's been a, a long standing. Both of my grandfathers were entrepreneurs at some points in their lives, sometimes the majority, sometimes a second one of my grandfathers uh, started a business after he retired, and it was a, a major orchard in Michigan. Uh, 
second half of life, to be sure. And my dad was and my uncles were. Uh, so I saw it up close. And I, and I just always assumed that that was a choice we could make. It was a much less common and talked about back in the Pleistocene when I was thinking about this. Um, but but as, not, as now, it's a very common it's in, and it's encouraged as a, as a life choice. But I, I learned it from the folks around me and I've been just plotting, uh, making my own path since then. I've been a self-employed entrepreneur for over 50 years. Now, I think growing up was never even an option that I even thought of, you know, to become an entrepreneur. And, you know, I, I fought some of the school system and then there just, you know, weren't as many opportunities, quite frankly, as there are now. Well, you're right. And and in fact, there's something still persists in that, Greg. And, that in, in, and it goes like this. I found this in my research for the book, is that one of the biggest impediments to entrepreneurship is knowing an entrepreneur or knowing entrepreneurs. And the two groups in society that know the fewest entrepreneurs are young people and older people. Now, eventually, I'd like to help with this intergenerational bridge. I think that's the long game here. But the fact is, is if you can aggregate ageless entrepreneurs, folks in the second half of life, and start to treat that as a valuable and recognized category of work life, um, I think we can grow this into something significant. So you're saying that actually knowing uh, somebody rather than having them be a model for you is actually an impediment? No, it was not not knowing any entrepreneurs is the impediment. And then making that subject area just to raise it all up, the, the, you know, the, the rising tide lift all the boats. There's all different kinds of entrepreneurship in the second half of life, but it's very rarely reported on that it's going on. But in fact, it is driving the system. There's more than half of our startups. Okay. Now, how do you recommend somebody that has worked, you know, most of their life for them to explore entrepreneurship and to, you know, to take the next steps? Sure. Well, the subcategories that I ended up breaking the book down as I was putting it together from my writing is, is threefold. Is you start small. I'll go through them first, and then maybe we can circle back to each of them. You want to start small. You want to start smart. And most of all, you want to start right now. And the starting small part of this is if you take the total number of businesses we had in the United States pre-pandemic, there was 32 million businesses in the United States. Of those 32 million, 25 million of 32 were one-person businesses. I mean, that's over 75% of the businesses in the United States as one-person business. There's no harm in this. It's often looked down on. When I started an economic development agency in a prior life, and I got to learn that language and hang around with state and national and regional economic development types, they would sneer at one-person businesses. They would call them lifestyle businesses. Um, well, if it's your business and it's supporting your life, there's nothing lifestyle about it. It's critical, and, and you're making a contribution to the world. And in my lifetime, there's never been an easier time to wrap yourself in the armor of a one-person business. Get an LLC around you. Get the insurance. Get the banking. That it, the world is getting set up for one person businesses in ways that I've never seen before. So you want to start small. It's the way to do it. The, the idea is, is that not to be a lone ranger as a one person business, but to do the next part is to start smart. And that's get yourself in a network of other small business people. That's why I'm helping start this center for ageless entrepreneurs is what happens then is you've got other peers that have had life experiences and separate skills and ones that you don't have, you have ones they don't have. Now you can put yourself together as a team. You're starting smart. And those teams can go out and meet individual projects as they come and go. And people can stay out there in longer terms on those projects or melt back into the group and pick it up again. So this idea of starting smart, and we have these communication technologies, look at us now talking over the, the computers, that, that are, are free and easy and ways to put networks and solutions together. So that's the start smart part. And I would really like to help enable that with this new nonprofit we're, we're doing. But maybe the most important part, Craig, is, is to start right now. And I, I try to quote that famous uh, line about when's the best time to plant a tree. And the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. I mean, these things take longer than you want. I, I'm doing it now for my umpteenth time. And it is driving me nuts how long it's taking, right? I'm just frustrated. And you just have to build that in. It does take a while. So you're going to start right now because it does take a while to get you, get in the game. And 
build the networks around yourself. So wouldn't it be safer just to continue on? And if, if that's an option for somebody in a in a job that you know, maybe they don't really care for, but that you know, pays the bills, provides insurance, et cetera? Or you know, do you think from what we've seen now that it actually is safer to become an entrepreneur or start your own company, I should say? So to your point exactly is that I'm not sure I heard the word hopefully, but I think it was in, intended in there. Hopefully you'll still have that job and they'll keep paying you and yeah. it, and everything will be fine and it'll all go forward. But um, putting your faith in a, that being a given, especially in the kind of environment we're in now, is I think is really risky. They used to tell us when we were kids, it was really scary to start your own business. In my opinion, it is much scarier not to. Doesn't mean you have to leave that day job. Doesn't mean you have to, but relying on it entirely for the goodwill from the goodwill of whoever owns it, the shareholders or the owners of it. Um, they're probably wonderful people, but you go into you never know when these black swans are going to come up. I mean, here's this pandemic thing. Who, who in the hell would have thought of this? Um, and yet, when these companies are just blown apart and then they start coming back together, it's the older salaries, higher salaries, older workers may not have a seat when that cakewalk music stops. Even though everybody likes you and it's a wonderful life and all of that, there's just circumstances that this happens. And we all live with aging and ageism. Uh, that's got a, That's a factor too. So the fact of the matter is I think you should turn that to your advantage and find other people with those life skills and I'll learn to align with them and to work together and take on some small projects and build out a, a, a more resilience in your life. Yeah. It seems like ageism might be the only, the last ism that's socially acceptable. Unfortunately, it is, um, it is profound. It's everywhere. It's nasty. I'm not going to solve it as much as I would love to. I have good friends who are working on it. What I think the, of this ageless startup in this center for ageless entrepreneurs, it's providing an alternative is, is let's just quit saying the glass is half empty and let's say the glass is half full. We're, we're a, a nation, a network, an international network of people with knowledge and networks and skills, especially the networks. I mean, the Rolodexes that we all have and the knowledge of what doesn't work. I mean, good Lord, that's valuable. So that's my way around ageism is to do better than the, the problem, not feel oppressed by the problem. I, I, of course, it's there. And there's a lot of people who live with, with the results of that that shouldn't. Um, this is one way to maybe find a path around it. What do you recommend are the next steps for somebody? And I guess maybe we should even go back and ask what type of businesses you know, do you recommend for either somebody that is just recently retired or somebody that's still in the workforce? Right. Well, I think that this one person business model that I'm talking about, you can certainly grow it to more than that if, if need be. But in this day and age, once you get two or three people in that are highly skilled, and, the, and they are applying their networks and their leverage, you can move mountains with, with really small teams. But so for those really small companies that I'm recommending, I, th I think a, a certain kinds of consulting, uh, subject matter expertise that you can share, you know, right away, everybody goes to, well, that's, you know, you got to be a neuroscientist or a physicist or, you know, have some tablet from the mountaintop. But, you know, the world needs landscapers and they're going to need advice on corporate landscaping and or fire safety suppression, you know, suppression systems. I, there's a there's room to advise people going forward on virtually every subject. And especially if you can combine that with your peers into a cohesive package that meets a specific demand at a specific time. These are wonderful. Now, these are, you know, a one-person business is not going to make the cover of most magazines. These are not hockey stick returns. The returns are often quite modest. There was a survey that, um, who did it? It was Encore.org. I really like that organization. They did a survey a while back, uh, but they asked these folks in this demographic, if you had your own small business, did a startup, how much more money would you make you happy? And the overwhelming majority of them said if they could make 15 to 20 grand, in addition to what they had coming in, they'd be thrilled. They'd be making a contribution. They would be putting some more resiliency and safety net into their life. Now, you can certainly grow it more than that. A group of them wanted to make 50 or 60, and that's fine. These are probably not million-dollar consulting jobs unless maybe you are a neuroscientist. 
But uh, for the rest of us landscapers out here and, you know, all of the people with, with these skills that we raised our family around, there's plenty of room to do new kinds of commerce around it. You can advise people on landscape. If you're in Portland, Maine, you can advise somebody in Portland, Oregon on how to do it. And their money's just as good. So you advise not reinventing the wheel necessarily, but just taking what you know and packaging it and going that route and doing consulting or something along those lines. And if I had to choose among the problems that I was going to look at, um, it reminds me of a, two different newspaper articles that were written about work I was doing. They were 20 years apart. One was back in the very early banner business, and one was in an engineering business later on. And the headlines were the same. It was Rick Darian does work nobody else wants. And that's finding the, if you're a landscaper, what is the hardest part? Where's the problem in landscaping or in neuroscience or in fire suppression systems? There, there is a problem somewhere in here. And if you're from those markets, you know where the problem is. It's somewhere in the supply chain, somewhere in the communications chain, you know where that problem is. And that's a value that newer people to an industry may not have, that insight. So I would set myself up as a one-person business and I would go tackle that problem and become the subject matter expert in that problem. That's how I have guided each of my next steps. I usually go find broken stuff broken stuff or stuff that no one wants to do and right. go from there. Correct. And if you can innovate in a, even the slightest way, you don't need intellectual property, you know, just a trade secret, something that you're doing a little bit different than the, the, the average bear, it gives you a heads up. And and I, I'll, I'll read something from my favorite business author. It's right over my computer here. It's this from Seth Godin, a really great business writer. And Seth says, the best way to make a hit is to build something for the smallest viable audience and make it so good that people tell their peers. That's the way we grow these little businesses. You want to make them small. You don't need to necessarily have hockey stick, you know, all the million likes and all of this stuff. That's all fun and, and, and interesting, but you need to solve a problem and you need to solve it for a few people or you can write invoices and they'll pay you what checks for it. Sign here, press hard. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, is there any form of validation that you recommend people do, or should they go ahead and set up a company and separate bank account, or how should they go about making sure that this is actually going to work? Right. Well, I am biased in the sense that in, in agreement with what you just said, you know, when we were younger, there was a, you know, this idea of putting a corporation around yourself, you know, you had to get a C corporation and register it in Delaware and, you know, double taxation. And right now the system is set up where you can get a corporate entity around yourself for a couple hundred bucks in, and usually do it in a, in a couple of weeks. I, every state is slightly different. And I'm in this case, I'm talking about the limited liability companies, LLCs, easy to get. The reason is an end game, not necessarily at the start. Anybody can start a business. You don't have to have those things. But if you start interacting with other entrepreneurs, they don't want an amateur in their network. The networks are only as strong as the weakest link here. And if somebody doesn't have their business insurance and the business banking and a corporation where the other people in the group can look at it and say, How, okay, you're playing by these rules. Show me the rules. What are those? I just need to know. We've all been led astray by, you know, big personalities and people that can do stuff. This is a game of just checking boxes in many cases. It's boring. It's tedious. But it's a, the fastest way to ensure stability in your business life. Um, so... I'm a big fan of an, an, an advocate of putting this corporate armor around yourself. It's cheap insurance. The, the whole, it lasts is half full side of this or empty, whatever one it is. If somebody sues your new company for something and you don't have one of those little corporations, you can take away everything you've got, right? But if you're a corporation that's and, and it's done something wrong, they can take that corporation and take it apart. Uh, but you are still not have risked your family and, and your loved ones in your own life, unless, of course, you've done something pretty heinous. But these are the reasons you do these. Why corporations were invented centuries ago is to put some limited liability around it. That's now trickled down to individuals in these societies that can do the same thing and protect themselves. But it's a, it's a roadmap for dealing with others rather than for so much as one to protect yourself. Now, does your book, Ageless Startup, kind of go into how to, how to do that? Uh, at, at great length, right. Uh, I wanted it to be an airy-fairy inspirational book, and my wonderful editor 
made me put in a whole bunch of checklists <laughs> and they're very good. So there, there is the inspirational parts and that's the part I, I like and I, I most enjoy, but there are plenty of checklists at each stage for judging yourself going in. How do you, you know, assign strengths and weaknesses to the ideas? How do you roll them out? Who's the first customers? What do you need to be in place? What do you need to keep information you need to gather from those customers? It's all in there. It is a handbook, and it, there are many handbooks for starting small businesses. Um, but this one, in between the inspirational stuff, is probably for people like the uh, title of your podcast is, uh, you know, 40 and up. I, there's a great quote from Dr. Carl Schramm. It's on the cover of the book. Dr. Schramm was a, the leader of the Kaufman Foundation for Entrepreneurship, and led that into its glory years. He said that... Uh, he said, brilliant. Ageless Startup is a handbook for how to shape your future so your most rewarding work lies ahead. Work that benefits you and makes a difference in the lives of countless others. A must for career planning for anyone over 40. So Dr. Schramm and I kind of agree on this. I tell people to start thinking about this at 40, start planning it at 45, and start doing it at 50. I've always wanted to start my own business, but you know, just never really knew how or what. I can remember being in a friend's dorm rooms and trying to brainstorm stuff, and it just never took off. I didn't have the right friends like a Bill Gates, or you know, quite possibly they didn't have the right friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're in a room with your, your friends looking up for ideas, it's the late pizza delivery, or it's the, uh, you know, some broken piece of what happened that night that everybody just brushed aside and said, oh, damn, that's a problem. Well, that's the opportunity. It's not just the problem. How much do you estimate that it costs to launch a, a one-person startup? You know, you can honestly do it for a few hundred dollars. The most expensive things are going to be the formation with your state. And in the book, there's a state-by-state -state resource listing at the back of, of where to start and how to find this, at least who to ask questions of. But it's usually a, a hundred or a, a, at most a few hundred dollars to form an LLC the first time. It's it's very simple. You, every state is encouraging this in their citizens. You want to have some business insurance. Uh, and it's a simple, basic business liability insurance. So there'll be some cost to that. But almost all the insurance have basic business packages to match up with just this kind. We're not going to be down, you know, building construction uh, on 40-story apartment buildings that are going to collapse and kill people. These are generally advice-led businesses. So the cost of insuring them is equally small. And then the, the rest of it is really not much. I mean, if, um, most of us, down to the, even if you need to just program it on your phone, I mean, there's a million ways to get in contact with people now. All these new networking services, uh, new ways to contact and meet with people. I'm having a a riot with this right now. I've, I've never seen a, an easier time to do sales, and I'm not getting on airplanes. I'm not driving six, seven hundred miles. I'm not getting up at three in the morning to get someplace. It do, and it doesn't cost anything. So it, it's a long-winded answer, Greg, to say it's really very inexpensive. It's a few hundred bucks. You want a, a presence on the web, and you want to have your hardwired armor around you. And you're good to go. Now you hit on something that a lot of people may or may, may not have experience with, and that's sales. Can you walk through how you recommend somebody you know, getting over that fear? I'm, I'm hesitant to say that it's easy because people, it's like public speaking, people are afraid of it. And, and in fact, now, nobody likes salespeople either, right? And, you know, where you're getting, oh, let me go talk to my manager. I'm going to go to I mean, you know, that there was a place for that stuff, you know, maybe when there was dinosaurs walking around, but not now. People are out searching for answers to make their lives better. And if you can be a subject matter expert and talk calmly and explain the package, and your solution, that's all the salesmanship you really need to know. Now, how you get in front of those people, I think is this is the easiest I've ever seen it in my entire life. I mean, look at this clubhouse phenomenon that's on uh, on the phone right now. I mean, you can meet in, a, in an evening, you can have you meet 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 people. I, there's one-on-one -on -one versions of that. Uh, Lunch Club is a very good one. All kinds of networking tools to put you in front of somebody, and you want to find out what they're doing and what their value is. You may need it, right? They're in that room self-selecting to find out what it is that others are doing and how they can improve their lives by subject matter expertise you have. I, I think it's as literally as simple as showing up in these new kinds of 
collegial spaces online. And once you get a little bit of this under your belt, most of the media loves talking about solutions and good news and something better than what we've been through. And so then that free media is, comes to you and you get to, you know, you don't get to control what's written, but um, you get your name in front of all kinds of new audiences. And, and that's the start now part about this. It takes a while to develop these, but you do it one or two at a time. You don't want 5,000 people coming through and wanting to buy something from you tomorrow. I think a lot of people too think of sales as past experiences have been, you know, somebody trying to sell a tractor to someone that lives in an apartment. Right. You're obviously not advocating that. You're just trying to sell somebody a, you know, a solution that will help make their life easier. And the new kind of sales is, first of all, you talk less than anybody in the room. Best salespeople say the fewest words. And you want to say no to people more than you say yes. Because you want a client and a customer that you can actually solve a problem for. And if you can't, you don't want the bad will. So you end up saying no more than yes. And and people respect that. Just say, no, I'm, I'd love to help, but don't give me that. And then the next thing is, but I know Helen in, in my network that does just that. Can I introduce you? Now you have made a future sale and you've made something for Helen. And Helen's probably going to kick somebody to you. And there we go. Has there been anything that we have, we've not covered that you would like to cover? So the book is, is doing fine, and I love talking about this book, and I'm really glad I got it in place. But a book only goes so far, uh, and, and, I'm, and you're not connecting, and it's, 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 it's a limited value. So how do you translate that into actual value and grow this subject for a wider audience? I started a nonprofit after this was published. I had a I had a whole public speaking career set up right as the pandemic was being uh, overwhelming us, and uh, that option needed to change quickly. So I started thinking, what can I do instead of getting in front of you know a few hundred people at a at a speaking event? Why don't I try to get in front of millions of people and maybe ultimately billions of people? And making life a little bit better for people in with a specific problem, and that problem is was described as work life in the second half of life. Right, we're at risk, and we need more resilience. We need a little more income. We need to solve problems in our own communities. So I changed from my public speaking to uh, change it into a uh, start a nonprofit around it. And we've got our IRS approval. It's a 501c3. I got a spectacular, hardworking board of directors, all of whom are working entrepreneurs in this ageless entrepreneur demographic. Um, The idea is to start this as a self-help club, come and meet your peers. The idea is when you can meet three or four people on an evening, and then you do that a few times in, in, over the course of a few months, when a project arises that comes directly to you or to one of them, and they say, okay, yeah, I can do that. Or you say, yeah, I can do that, but I'm going to need a team for this. So you go to them. You've already earned their trust. You already know them. They've already, by being in the group, you know that they're uh, meeting the minimum requirements of having these corporations and, and all the check boxes for insurance and all that stuff. You are working with your peers. That's a, a valuable exercise for somebody in that demographic to get into right now. I want to make that infrastructure a safe place, bring them in. But I also think that there's a higher calling for everybody involved is if you take a group of really experienced older people who are emerging as new entrepreneurs and new subject matter experts, and instead of mixing them together, which is the first goal of mine, but put their backs together and face out to the world and say, this is the most powerful subject matter group that you'll ever find. I figured this out, Greg. I did the math and I had to do it a couple times, but there's 100 million people in the United States between 45 and 65 right now give or take. Survey before the pandemic said that 25% of them wanted to start their own enterprise. Now it's higher. It's up around a third. But even if you take a quarter, that's 25 million people. That's that's 10 years of job growth in the United States. If you took those 25 million people and just assumed they had 30 years of experience, they're 50 or 55, something like that, that's 750 million people human years of experience. That's a powerful value statement. And look at all the problems that could be applied to in their own communities and their own markets that they know. It's, uh, it is an opportunity and the glass is definitely half full. So 
it, my board uses, uh, my, especially my board chair uses a phrase that this could be the Angie's list for LinkedIn. Uh, I think it's probably got some trademark uh, coverage that I probably shouldn't get too enthusiastic about using it. But that's the idea is that there's an ageless group within LinkedIn. And here's a, a screen, a bow to tie around that group. And people can come in and pick and choose among that demographic and those subject areas. Yeah, and LinkedIn has become an incredible resource. I never thought I would use it as much as I have. Yeah, no, it's it's very good. It's a great way to reach across not just industries, but across countries. I mean, I did a, a podcast interview yesterday with a young man in Oman. Uh, we met on LinkedIn. Very cool. Well, what's the number one piece of advice that you can give our listeners? So I tell people that it, this entrepreneurship in the second half of life, it's not hard. It's just new. And people are daunted by new stuff at any age, but it's not hard. And many of people our age have done many harder things than this. It is not blessed knowledge that you get. It's some skill that you've learned and skinned your knuckles over throughout your life that you can turn into a subject matter expert around and and create your own entrepreneurship platform. It's not a way to buy shoes for the kids. It's not a way to pay rent. It's going to take some time. But uh, there's very few of us who don't need more resiliency and more security in our lives. And the fact that you can do this with your peers and solve some significant problems along the way is a a bonus. Resiliency is something that the pandemic has has taught us that we need to have. Boy, I'll say. Didn't see that coming. You know, and nobody did. And, uh, you know, that's one of this this day job I have of of working in the food systems is, I mean, we came so close. The the CEO of Hormel said out loud, he said, the, the supply chain for the entire food system is breaking. That's a scary thing to say to 350 million people. Yeah. Might not should have said that. Well, you could have talked right, and I don't know if it was a hot mic or what, but uh, problems and dangers is, is, is opportunities. I'm not exactly sure how that quote all comes together, but people point to a Chinese proverb on it. We do have an opportunity right now, and there is danger around, and especially for older workers. But the idea is to armor up. This isn't hard. It's just new. You can do it. Get that stuff in place and take the first baby steps. If you don't expect immediate high returns, if you are modest in your expectations, it can be a really life-changing event. Now, what's the URL for the Center for Ageless Entrepreneur? Well, sure. So first, the book one, the book site is up and running and it's doing really well. So that is ageless-startup.com. And there is a a sign-up sheet there. uh, The Center for Ageless Entrepreneurs is agelessentrepreneurs.com. Dot org and that has a cloak over it right now as I'm building out that system but I it, it it's it'll be opening probably in a month and I'm taking uh, inquiries now for people who want to come in we'll probably have a deep discount or even free start while we launch it as a pilot but there's there's strong interest I'm getting interest from all over the world on that thing it's really going to be interesting this would be a great opportunity for people to get into the Center for Ageless Entrepreneurs. I am going to definitely sign up. we got a place for you, Greg. We're waiting for you. Well, thank you, Rick, for being a guest on Entrepreneurs Over 40. Look for his book, Ageless Startup, Start a Business at Any Age on Amazon. Great. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate the conversation. That was just a great conversation with Rick Terry. And uh, some of my key takeaways from it were that the majority of startups are done by people 45 and older. Rick said that one of the biggest impediments to entrepreneurship that he's found is not knowing an entrepreneur to model after or learn from. He also said that in school, we were taught that it was scary to start your own business, but today it is much scarier not to. There's never been a better time to start a one-person business than right now. It does take a while to build up your networks of fellow experts, so get in the game now. He said there's room to advise people in just about any subject. Do the work no one else wants. Find the problems in your area of expertise and become the subject matter expert. You know where the problems are, and newer people entering the field may not know them. If you can innovate or do something just a little different than the average bear, it gives you an advantage. He also said that there's never been an easier time to do sales. There are all kinds of new online networking tools to get in front of people. In the new kind of sales, you talk less, listen more, and often say no more than yes. It's often a very consultative approach. 
Those are just some of my key takeaways from the conversation with Rick. I advise you to go out, purchase his book. It's at ageless-startup.com. And the Center for Ageless Entrepreneurs is at agelessentrepreneurs.org. Join us next week as we talk to Dave Stokes of authortoaudio.com and discuss how he helps authors develop their own audiobooks. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40. Check us out at entrepreneursover40.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast directory.